Спасибо. Добрый вечер, дорогие друзья. Вы присутствуете сегодня в библиотеке Голицына, откуда мы ведем трансляцию поэтического вечера. У нас в гостях английский, преподаватель английского языка, англичанка Джан Станбери, которая прочитает поэзию 20 века, стихи, посвященные войнам, трагедиям, которые они несут людям. И если у вас будут какие-то соображения, если вы захотите что-то написать, то вы можете в чате оставить свои вопросы, и Джан в конце ответит на все вопросы. Пожалуйста. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Lena. We are all socially distant here in the Galitza Library, so I'm going to remove my mask um, to make it easier for, for reading. So, some months ago, Lena and I, well, probably a year ago, Lena and I discussed the possibility of having this poetry reading. But of course, since then, um, life has changed unrecognizably. And coronavirus has made it so that we unfortunately cannot meet in person. And I must confess to you that I am a technological dinosaur. And it's only thanks to to, to Lena and, and the technical team here um, that we are able to do this this evening. So, so um, I'm sorry, what is on the screen? Uh, on Just, the screen, uh, your face. Yeah, okay, good, it's all right. So, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, this, this evening, this evening is, is about, um, war poetry and um, originally this was meant to be back in November because that is the month of novembrance in in Britain and and America and most of Europe um, and if you go to Britain at the beginning of November you will find I was it's going up here because I'm, I'm rather low you will see that everyone will be wearing this this poppy here. They will be wearing a poppy. And I do mean literally more or less everyone. Um, because the poppy has become uh, a huge symbol of remembrance. And um, Lena tells me she has already done um, programs or whatever about this and put them on YouTube, in but Russian. in ah, in Russian, so I'm going to give you this in English. So I thought before we actually start the reading and involving the reading, we would look at how the poppy became um, the symbol of remembrance. And to understand that, we have to go back just over 100 years to the First World War. Now, the First World War was an absolutely hideous war. It was absolutely monstrous. And as we know, the First World War took place mostly in the trenches of northern France. And if you know anything about gardening, you will know that when land is turned over, as it was during the war, you get poppies. And if you look at poppies en masse, so for example, I have this picture here. Um, sorry, I didn't practice this. If you see this picture, you can see that this red looks simply like a pool of blood. Now, the Flanders poppy was first 
was first described as the flower of remembrance by someone called Colonel John McRae. And before the First World War, he was a well-known professor of medicine in um, Canada. And he ended up at the front line in France. And after the, bat after the Second Battle of Ypres in 1915, he scribbled a few words in pencil in his notebook. And those words have become the poem that we know as Flanders Field. So that is going to be our first poem. It is called In Flanders Fields. In the No, I think we don't have the camera. I thought we had to click here. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Excellent. So, this is In Flanders Fields by John McRae. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. O poppies grow in Flanders fields. Now, these verses were sent anonymously to Punch magazine and published under the title in Flanders Fields. No, no, I, I, I need me now. Okay. There, I'll we go. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> so, as I said, these words were sent anonymously to the Punch magazine, which some of you may be familiar with. Now, in January of 1918, um, Colonel McRae was wounded and he was taken as a stretcher case um, to a large hospital on the coast of northern France. And on the third evening, he was wheeled to the balcony of his room to look over the sea towards the cliffs of Dover. And these verses from Slanders Fields were very obviously in his mind. So he told the doctor who was in charge of his case, Tell them this. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. So that same night, Colonel McRae died, and he was buried in a cemetery which actually overlooks the channel from France to England. Now, we know that the First World War came, finally came to an end at 11 o'clock on the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918. Now, it so happens that an American lady, Miss Moina Michael, read McRae's poem and it greatly impressed her. And it was particularly the last verse which, which got to her, especially. Now, there was a meeting, and she appeared wearing a puppy. And it appeared to her 
that the poppy really was a symbol of all those who had died in the war. And she wrote a reply to Macrae's poem, and this is called The Victory Emblem. Oh, you who sleep in Flanders fields, sleep sweet, the rise anew. We caught the torch you threw, and holding high, we kept with faith with those who died. We cherish too the poppy red that grows on fields where valour led. It seems to signal to the skies that blood of heroes never dies, but lends a luster to the red of the flower that blooms above the dead in Flanders' fields. And now the torch and poppy red wear in honour of our dead. Fear not that ye have died for naught. We've learnt the lesson that ye taught in Flanders' fields. Now, whenever I read that poem, I cannot but feel extreme sadness. Look at the last lines of that poem. Fear not that ye have died for naught. We've learnt the lesson that ye taught in Flanders' fields. Well, huh, sadly, we did not learn the lesson. And we know that 21 years later, men were again fighting in terms of the Second World War. Now, on November the 9th in 1982, eight, sorry, in 1918, only two days before the armistice was signed, Miss, Miss Michael, who wrote that poem, was presented with a small gift of money. And it was given as a huge poppy factory. And um, there are about 160 disabled uh, ex-servicemen who, who work there. And during the year, they produce... 45 million, 45 million of these poppies and um, 80,000 wreaths. Now, you, you know what I mean by wreath is a, a round of poppies. And these poppies are used in the Armistice Day service, which I'll speak about in a minute. Now, this, this selling of these poppies, I mean, it, it is something quite huge. Um, as I said, um, 45, 45, 50 million poppies are made and sold each year. And I say sold because there's no price to one of these. There's absolutely no price. People give a donation. They give absolutely what they want to give. So, for example, a couple of years ago, um, I knew that I was giving a, um, a talk on, on rem about poetry in connection with the war, and I explained this to, 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 to the person that I, I wanted some poppies from, and he just gave me a whole handful of poppies to take back to Russia, and I obviously just gave a, um, a generous donation to, to thank them for that. So it's all donations and thousands millions of pounds are raised through these poppies and all that money is used to help the the widows and the families of um, ex-servicemen who have died and of course help to support servicemen who are severely injured who lose limbs or whatever in wars and of course this is now not just obviously all the all the veterans of the first world war are dead um, and and so this is used for all servicemen who are involved in any conflict whatsoever 
who, who go and fight as British troops. Now, some of you will perhaps know that a couple of years ago, no, six years ago now, um, something rather special happened in, in London to commemorate the end, or, or the beginning, I'm sorry, of the First World War. And a young, a young PhD student called Paul Cummins, he had the idea of making ceramic poppies. And these ceramic poppies, which were all made by volunteers, you probably, if I can't see which way this is going, which were all made by volunteers, were then placed in and around the Tower of London. Now, were we meeting in person, I have a, a slideshow of these poppies, which, which I would have been able to show you. And if I just show you this picture, I can't see which way this machine, I can't see my, oh, here it is. If you can see this picture, okay, this here, which look, oh, sorry, I can't work out left or right from this, this here, is simply ceramic poppies. And lots of people, for example, Her Majesty the Queen, she went and, 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 and laid one and members of the, of the royal family and all sorts of people. And later, um, and there were 888, 246 of these ceramic poppies. And each one represents um, someone who gave their life, who lost their life during the, um, during the war. Um, and later, these poppies were sold at £25 each. So needless to say, they raised a huge amount of money. Now... Our next poem we're, we're going to have a look at really isn't a great poem at all, but it is important because, because um, as I said, every year the... Okay, every year Armistice Day is remembered. O okay? Are we all right? Okay. Now, is this on the screen? Yes. I, I, can we take it off the screen, please? Can we take it off the screen? Thank you. Okay. So, tradition, the, the armistice was signed on the 11th of November, 1918. Now, every year we commemorate this, and this used, well, this is called Armistice Day. And tr originally, when Armistice Day was marked, everything used to stop at 11 o'clock, and a two-minute silence was observed. But obviously, life goes on, life has got faster, and so this doesn't happen. I, I do remember when I was at school that at 11 o'clock, the whole school stopped and stood, and we observed the two-minute silence. And this still happens all over the country and not, not only in churches. But this, this observance of the armistice has been moved now to what is called Remembrance Sunday. And services, the special remembrance services, are held in churches on the Sunday which is closest to Remembrance Day. And the service follows a particular pattern um, and 
it, it, it includes a verse from the next poem that we are going to have a look at. As I said, the next poem isn't a particularly noteworthy poem, but it is very, very significant because of one verse. Okay, so if we could have the poem for the fallen by Florence Binion. For the fallen. With proud thanksgiving, a mother for her children, England mourns for her dead across the sea. Flesh of her flesh they were, spirit of her spirit, fallen in the cause of the free. Solemn the drums thrill, death august and royal, sing sorrow up into a mortal's fears. There is music in the midst of desolation and a glory that shines upon our tears. Oh, they went with songs to the battle. They were young, straight of limb, true of eye, steady and aglow. They were staunch to the end against odds uncounted. They fell with their faces to the foe. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. They mingle not with laughing comrades again. They sit no more at familiar tables of home. They have no lot in our labour of the daytime. They sleep beyond England's foam. But where our desires are and our hopes profound, felt as a wellspring that is hidden from sight, to the innermost heart of their own land, they are known as the stars are known to the night. As the stars that shall be bright when we are dust, moving in marches upon the heavenly plain. As the stars that are starry in the time of our darkness. To the end, to the end, they remain. Now, as I said, this, this poem isn't particularly great, but the one verse is especially significant. Because just before 11 o'clock, at every service, be it in a church or be it outside or whatever, this verse, they shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old, age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. Then we have a bugle playing, which plays a, um, which plays a piece of music known as the last post then there is the two minute silence and then the bugle plays again and then that part of the service is concluded with this koima prayer when you go home tell them this of us and say for your tomorrow we gave our today and so that pattern of the service is absolutely standard throughout the land and in countries all over the world. Now, so this poppy resembles, okay, the poppy, this red poppy, um, represents those who fell, giving their lives. And some of you may have heard 
about something called the white poppy. And this, this has in some ways caused quite a lot of controversy. Um, but I think it's just important to point out exactly what the white poppy symbolizes. It was the creation of the Peace Pledge Union, which is the oldest pacifist organization in Britain. And since 1934, they have been campaigning for a warless world. Now, I think we'd all agree that that is a pretty good aim. Now, this white poppy, um, which has been in existence since 1933, um, represents remembrance for all victims of war. And we know that in any war, civilians also lose their lives. So that's what the white poppy represents. And it also represents a commitment to peace. And it also is to challenge attempts to for those who, for whatever reasons, and I can't imagine, try to glamorize or celebrate war. So that is what the white poppy stands for. It is against any attempts to glamorize or celebrate war. So, let's move on now and look at, in a moment, one of the greatest poems, one of the one of the greatest poets of World War I, and that is Wilfred Owen. And we're going to have a look at probably his most famous poem in a moment, Dulce e Decorum Est. Now, before we have a look, I think it's important to, to, to set the scene a little bit. And I have with me something which may be very familiar to many of you, and that is, of course, a gas mask. This one happens to be, it, it's a Russian one, it's not a British one. It's a Russian gas mask it's given to me by one of my military friends. And again, I've got here, which I would have passed around if we were in person, um, some pictures, which you may or may not be able to see. And now, which, which um, I can't can't work out which way this goes. Ah, there we are, thank you. And here we can see the cart which collects dead bodies, those who die in the trenches. And that's important as our, for our poem. And going back to our gas masks, this one is actually slightly amusing. Sorry, can you, I want to see the top of it. Because here you can see... To, to women talking to each other um, across the fence wearing their gas masks at home. Oh, thank you, thank you. So, right, let's, let's come on to, to our next poem, Dolce e Decorum Est. Now, uh, yeah. poison gas, just, just for your information, poison gas was first used in the Second Battle of Ypres in 1915. And before we read, it is necessary to understand the meaning of Dulce e Decorum Est. And you might like to remember this as we read, because this comes from the Roman poet Horace, and these words mean, it is sweet and honourable to die for your country. It is sweet and honourable to die for your country. Now, uh, sorry, I asked for the poem too quickly. Can we go back a bit? Go back to me. Thank you. So, war as we know, is a very ugly business. And in, the in, in 1914, remember, there was no TV, no internet, and, you, uh, and Britain hadn't ex the experience of a war on its own doorstep. And 
the truth of what was happening in northern France was not known in Britain until the soldiers returned and started spreading the horrors of what was actually happening on the front line. And up until that moment, people in Britain were still caught up in the ridiculous patriotic fervour because they had no idea whatsoever of what was really going on. Now, Owen actually distrusted very much the traditional ideologies that kept the war going. And despite that, he served as an infantry officer and was wounded in 1917 and actually was awarded the Military Cross, which is a great honour. Sadly, he was killed one week before the armistice. And his mother received the telegram informing her of his death on Armistice Day, on the day the war ended. Now, William Owen's poetry is basically shocking and realistic. And it truly portrays the horrors of trench and gas warfare. And that's what we're going to have a look at now. Dulci a decorum est by Wilfred Owen. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge. Till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Men had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshed. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas! Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, Drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie, dulci a decorum est, pro patria mori. And... I think we can well and truly feel the horror of trench warfare in that poem. Now, our, our last poem from, from the First World War is by the poet Isaac Rosenberg, and it involves one of these. I don't know if you can, well, I can't work it out, one of these. You can see what it is, it's a rat. And not only is the poppy a symbol of war, World War I, 
but the rat also. He calls those men were in rat infested trenches day after day. They were standing in trenches, waterlogged trenches. They had no decent place to sleep, to eat, to wash, to go to the toilet. They suffered in the most disgusting circumstances. And rats. Now again, I ooh, can't, don't know whether you can see with these pictures. Here we've got, here are some of the rats that one of the favourite terriers caught in the trenches. See them hanging up there? Rat after rat after rat. And this poem is called Break of Day in the Trenches by Isaac Rosenberg. Okay, all right. Now, just before we get, there's only, um, I don't know you, I don't know who you are, I don't know about your English, um, but there's one word there in, 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 the, in, the, in the fourth line, sardonic. Um, so this, this is a very unusual word, not often used. Um, and if you are sardonic, it shows that you have a very low opinion of everyone and everything. Okay, so this is actually uh, a poem about a rat. The darkness crumbles away. It is the same old druid time as ever. Only a live thing leaps my hand, a queer, sardonic rat. As I pull the parapet's poppy to stick behind my ear. Sorry, do, do, we need. So, I'm sorry. Someone, someone has just come in, but they're not wearing a mask. So we we need a mask, please. I'm sorry, Lena. What's going on here? Sorry, people, we're, we're just dealing with the situation here. Right, let's start again, please. I'm very sorry about that. This is Break of Day in the Trenches by Isaac Rosenberg. The darkness crumbles away. It is the same old druid time as ever. Only a live thing leaps my hand, a queer sardonic rat. As I pull the parapet's poppy to stick behind my ear. Aha, <laughs> droll rat. They would shoot you if they knew your cosmopolitan sympathies. Now you have touched this English hand. You will do the same to a German soon, no doubt, if it be your pleasure to cross the sleeping green between. It seems you inwardly grin as you pass. Strong eyes, fine limbs, haughty athletes. Less chance than you for life. Bonds to the whims of murder, sprawled in the bowels of the earth, the torn fields of France. What do you see in our eyes at the shrieking iron and flame hurled through the heavens? What quaver, what heart aghast. Poppies, whose roots are in man's veins, drop and are ever dropping. But mine is safe in my ear, just a little white with the dust. Now, we haven't really time to, to, to discuss that poem, um, but just to say that it is, it is Rosenberg's idea was that um, the rat, you know, if you can picture this rat, and he, at the, at the time of writing, he's on the English side. And then in a moment, he's going to, to cross the trench, and he's going to be on the German side. 
And what Rosenberg is saying that, um, you know, it's highlighting, I think, our stupidity and the futility of war. And this, this poem, in this poem, he is showing that in actual fact, we share a common humanity. And it is that humanity, which is more this common humanity, which is more important than anything. Now, we're going to have a, a bit of a change of mood because we're going to, to go modern now. And I've selected next to read um, a poem by one of the Liverpool poets, Roger McGough. Now, I don't know if you're very familiar with the, um, with the Liverpool poets. Basically, the three most famous are Adrian Henry, Roger McGough, and Brian Patton. And um, these poets, who wrote prolifically in the, in the 1960s and thereafter, have a, a really direct way of expressing what they want to say. They use simple language, and very often in their poems, there is humour, but please don't think that that humour is um, in any way masking the serious message of their poems. Roger McGough was actually famous for being part of a pop group called The Scaffold. And um, you remember The Scaffold. They had a very famous song called Lily the Pink. I don't know. Anybody remember? Lily the Pink, the Pink, the Pink. And thank you very much for the NGI. All of those who, if you're as old as me, you'll, you'll remember those. And interestingly, in, in, in the band The Scaffold, um, Ringo Starr played the drums. And there was a character in the band called Reg Dwight. Anybody know who Reg Dwight became? Oh, Elton John. Okay, so now in a minute we've got the, the, next, um, the next poem. But I just want to explain to you, it talks about a dance and it talks about a quadrille. And a quadrille, as the name implies, is all about dancing in a, in a circle. All right. And it talks about um, Dozy Doe. Now, again, if you were here in, po in person, I would show you the Dozy Doe because it's when you link arms and you link arms and link arms like, like that. So you just have to imagine because we can't do it. OK, so let's have a look, please, at a square dance. In Flanders fields in northern France, they're all doing a brand new dance. It makes you happy and out of breath. And it's called the Dance of Death. Everybody stands in line. Everybody's feeling fine. We're all going to a hop. One, two, three. Over the top. It's the dance designed to thrill. It's the mustard gas quadrille. A dance for men. Girls have no say in it. For your partner is a bayonet. See how the dancers sway and run to the rhythm of the gun. Swing your partner dozy doed. All around the shells explode. Honour your partner, form a square. <sighs> Smell the burning in the air. Over the barbed wire kicking high. Men, like shirts, hung out to dry. Oh, if you fall, that's no disgrace. Someone else will take your place. Old soldiers never die. Only young ones. 
Flanders fields where mortals bla mortars blaze. They're all doing the latest craze. Khaki dancers out of breath, doing the glorious dance of death. Doing the glorious <laughs> dance of death. I'm coming back, just a minute. <laughs> okay, here we go. Thanks, Anna. So, Uma, the message is clear. Very, very clear. Now, I want to move on to, um, first of all, to look at one of the most iconic pictures of the last century and I'm sure you will all recognize this picture. Now, uh, I can't get the left, the left to right. I'm sure you all recognize this picture, don't you? One of the most famous pictures of one of the... Yeah, Vietnam. Vietnam. Yes, yes. And yeah, this picture is of um, a napalm attack during the Vietnamese war or the, or the war in Vietnam. It was, was taken um, by um, a photographer called Nick Ut, and the young girl in the picture, the one who is naked. Her name is King Chui, and she actually survived that attack and eventually ended up in Canada where she has started a foundation for um, medical and psychological assistance to um, child victims of war. And I, I think it's quite amazing. I have here something she said. He said, forgiveness made me free from hatred. I still have many scars on my body and severe pain most days, but my heart is cleansed. Napalm is very powerful, but faith, forgiveness and love are much more powerful. We would not have war at all if everyone could learn how to live with love, hope and forgiveness. So, our next poem, before we begin, I just want to um, just I'm sure you're all familiar with the word vomit. Vomit is a synonym for sick, okay? Lena, if we could have the next poem, please. This is a poem by Adrian Mitchell, who is a contemporary of Roger McGough and one of the Liverpool poets. Um, we need before, mm -hmm. no, before this, before, 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 please. This is the next one. There we are. Yeah, that's it. So can we get rid of me? Can we get rid of me? Okay. This is Ceasefire by Adrian Mitchell. Dedicated to the work of medical aid for Vietnam, 36 Wellington Street, London, WC2. The outside of my body was half eaten by the fire, which clings as tight as skin. 
The fire has turned some of my skin into black scab bits of roughness and some pale bits smooth as plastic, which no one dares touch except me and the doctor. Everyone who looks at me is scared. That's not because I want to hurt people, but because so much of me looks like the meat of a monster. I was walking to the market. Then I was screaming. They found me screaming. They put out the flames on my skin. They laid me on a stretcher and I cried, Not on my back! So they turned me over and I cried, Not on my front! The doctor put a needle in my arm and my mind melted and I fell into a furnace of dreams of furnaces. When I woke up, I was in a white hospital. Everything I wanted to say scared me, and I did not want to scare the others in that white hospital, so I said nothing. I cried as quietly as I could. Months passed over my head, and bombers passed over my head, and people came and said they were my parents. And they found out the right places on my face where I could bear to be kissed. And I pretended I could see them, but I couldn't really look out of my eyes, but only inwards, into my head, where the flames still clung and hurt. The voice of the flames said, You are meat. You are most ugly meat. Your body cannot grow to loveliness. Nobody could love such ugly meat. Only ugly meat could love such ugly meat. Better to be stewed for soup and eaten. And months passed over my head. And the bombers passed over my head. The voices of the flames began to flicker and I began to believe the people who said they were my parents were my parents. And one day I threw myself forward so that I sat up in bed for the first time and hurled my arms around my mother and however the skin of my chest howled out its pain, I held her. I held her. I held her and knew she was my mother. And I forgot that I was monster meat. And I knew she did not know that I was monster meat. I held her. I held her. And sweet sun, which blesses all the world, all the flames faded, the flames of my skin and the flames inside my head, all the flames faded and I was flooded with love for my mother who did not know that I was monster meat and so in the love flood I let go of my mother and fell back upon my pillow and I rolled my head to the left side and saw a child or it might have been an old man eating his rice with his only arm. And I rolled my head to the right side and I saw another child. She might have been an old woman, woman being fed through the arm from a tube from a red bottle. And I loved them. And flooded with love, I started to sing the song of the game I used to play with my friends in the long ago days before the flames came. One, one, 
I bounce the ball once for the cobbler at the corner. Two, two, I bounce the ball twice for the fisherman on the river. Three, three, I bounce the ball three times four, my golden lover. <gasps> and I had to stop singing. Throat choked with vomit. And then the flames exploded again all over my skin. And then the flames again exploded inside my head. And I burned, sweet son, sweet mother. I burned. Sweet son, which blesses all the world. This was one of the people of Vietnam. Make him or her whatever age you like. He or she is dead. A one-armed man or boy survives. A woman or girl whose body needs a change of blood each day survives. I suppose we love each other. We're stupid if we don't. We have a choice, either to choke to death on our own vomit or to become one with the sweet sun which blesses all the world. Now, still Still on the theme of um, Vietnam, you may recall that in fact the, the war in Vietnam caused a great deal of controversy in the United States. Now, as we know, I think I'm right in saying that America is not guilty of being the first to declare war on any country in recent history, but it does have a record of going in to support those they feel need their support. Now, as regards the Vietnam War, it goes without saying that not all Americans agreed with their government's decision to go in to support the South Vietnamese. And including, I might add, um, Muhammad Ali, who was world champion at that time and who was stripped of his title because he would not go and fight in Vietnam. And he famously said, you know what, you know what um, Muhammad Ali was like? He's one of my all-time heroes. I just love him. But um, um, and he, he, he is famed for saying, then Viet Cong ain't done nothing to me. And so he absolutely refused to go and to, to enlist in the, in the army. But it is, of course, the right of, of anyone in a democracy to protest. I would say perhaps their duty to protest if they disagree with what the government is doing. And as I said, the war in Vietnam sparked massive massive opposition and the next poem is all about that it is about someone who protested and who protested in a most extreme way against the war in Vietnam and it is Norman Morrison Again by Adrian Mitchell. On November the 2nd, 1965, in the multicolored, multi minded, united, beautiful states of terrible America, Norman Morrison set himself on fire outside the Pentagon. He was 31. He was a Quaker. 
and his wife, seen weeping in the newsreels, and his three children, survive him, survive him as best they can. He did it in Washington, where everyone could see. Because people were being set on fire in the dark corners of Vietnam, where nobody could see. Their names, ages, beliefs and loves are not recorded. This is what Norman Morrison did. He poured petrol over himself. He burned. He suffered. He died. That is what he did in the white heart of Washington where everyone could see. He simply burned away his clothes, his passport, his pink tinted skin, put on a new skin of flame and became Vietnamese. Now, I, I think there was, um, can we go back to, to, to the main frame? Can we go back to me, Lena, please? Can we go back to me? Sorry, I, I think there was a mistake with this. I, I wrote to Lena with, I, I, Lena was very kind to find the poems to, 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 to put online. Um, and I did write to say that the version of this poem, the one that appears, the one that you have seen, is not the right version. Um, I did send the right version, the one that I have just read, but I think maybe, Lena, you didn't see it. I, I sent the right version, um, but obviously, I think what happened is that other people must have written about this incident, um, and it's very interesting, and um, I hope that this wasn't attributed, this one that you saw, wasn't attributed to, 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 um, to Adrian Mitchell, because in fact, the date on this one, which I have never seen before, is dated April 20th, 2011, um, but Adrian Mitchell died in 2008. Um, so it certainly isn't um, his. Um, maybe, Lena, um, maybe it would be possible to put the correct, to send the correct version to people, um, because I, I'd really like them to, to, to have that. Um, well, that rather spoiled it a bit, but never mind. Um, it's, as you can say, it's a very, very powerful poem. Yeah. And the ending there. He simply burned away his clothes, his passport, his pink tinted skin, put on a new skin of flame, and became Vietnamese. Now, I think there's no more powerful way of protesting than that. I've just got a, a couple more. Have we got time for them, Lena? Yes. Um, now, the next one is a, again a very well-known poem by W. H. Auden called Refugee Blues. Now, this, this poem written at the time of the Second World War is of course about, um, it's about German Jews who were refugees. But I, I chose to read this one, or to include it in this reading, because I think that it's very, very relevant today. Um, now, we hear a lot about uh, refugees who are desperately trying to get to mainland Europe. And we are constantly hearing of, of tragedies um, of these migrants who are trying to, to cross the Mediterranean. And I have to say, um, I feel ashamed every time that I hear of migrants who die in their attempt to cross the channel. 
Now, I understand those who have a fear that Europe, Britain, Europe, are being overrun by undesirable foreigners and this paranoia about the Islamification of Europe. But I think what we need to remember, as Auden points out to us in his poem, that today's refugees and immigrants are, after all, they belong to the human race, just like you and me. Anyway, let's have a look at Refugee Blues. Say this city has 10 million souls. Some are living in mansions, some are living in holes. Yet there's no place for us, my dear. Yet there's no place for us. Once we had a country and we thought it fair. Look in the atlas and you'll find it there. Cannot go there now, my dear. You cannot go there now. The village churchyard that grows an old yew. Every spring it blossoms anew. Old passports can't do that, my dear. Old passports can't do that. <clears throat> the consul banged the table and said, If you've got no passport, you're officially dead. But we are still alive, my dear. But we are still alive. Went to a committee. They offered me a chair. Asked me politely to return next year. But where shall we go today, my dear? But where shall we go today? Came to a public meeting. The speaker got up and said, If we let them in, they will steal our daily bread. He was talking of you and me, my dear. He was talking of you and me. Thought I heard the thun thunder rumbling in the sky. It was Hitler over Europe saying, They must die. We were in his mind, my dear. We were in his mind. Saw a poodle in a jacket fastened with a pin. Saw a door opened and a cat let in. But they weren't German Jews, my dear. But they weren't German Jews. Went down the harbour and stood upon the quay. Saw the fish swimming as if they were free. Only ten feet away, my dear. Only ten feet away. Walked through a wood, saw the birds in the trees. They had no politicians and sang at their ease. They weren't the human race, my dear. They weren't the human race. Dreamt I saw a building with a thousand floors, a thousand windows and a thousand doors. Not one of them was ours, my dear. Not one of them was ours. Stood on a great plain in the falling snow. Ten thousand soldiers marched to and fro. Looking for you and me, my dear. Looking for you and me. Oh. And 
getting me back to you any minute now, I think. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Now, we, we all know that it was Fat Man and Little Boy, the bombs which landed on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that ended World War II. And since then, we have lived with the fear of a third world war. And the fear that the third world war will be the final one, because it would or will be nuclear. Now, we're constantly worrying about the wrong countries having nuclear capability. Who decides who is right and who is wrong? I don't know. But it brings us to our next and our final poem, which is called um, Icarus All Sorts. And this also is written by uh, Roger McGough, who wrote The Square Dance. Now, the thing is with this, um, there are a, a, a number of um, cultural thing, references, which it might, I'll just mention before we, we read it, because it may, might help you to understand. Now, Icarus all sorts. Well, you all know Icarus, don't you? That's right. Icarus is wings and he flew too close. Yeah, to the, to the sun. Yes, yes. Now, th there's a bit of a pun in this title because something called, when I was a child at Christmas, um, when I put my stocking at the end of my bed, I always hoped that in the morning there would be a box of sweets called licorice all sorts. And they were different types of, of, of licorice is black, of course, and with, with, with this fondant filling, and some of them had pink bits on them and blue bits or whatever. So this, I think, is a bit of a pun on, on licorice all sorts. It's Icarus all sorts. Now, um, it speaks about traffic lights, which you all know. And, um, but I wonder oh, I've, if you're all familiar with this. I think it's a very English kind of game called Bingo. You know, bingo, where, where, and there are big, oh, I suppose it was in the 50s. There used to be these large bingo halls, and people used to go and play this game of bingo. And um, you had to sort of, there were numbers on it, and you had to cross off the numbers that the person was called. I don't think I've ever played it, but anyway. So, and if you were the first to cross all the numbers on your card, you shouted, bingo. All right, and, and then hopefully you got a prize. Now, <clears throat> so um, we, 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 um, th there, is, there is a reference to, to Philip in the poem, and that is referring to uh, Prince Philip, and it refers to, to another um, English uh, nursery rhyme about the, the queen was in the, in, was in the, in, in the parlour counting out the money. Oh, okay. So, that's a, a cultural reference. Um, now, oh, and we're coming up to the, the season of carol singers. Now, I'm sure many of you know that carols sing, well, carols are special Christmas hymns and songs. And during this season, um, people go, little groups of people go around from house to house and sing carols. And um, hopefully the people in the house will come out and they will give some money to, to the carol singers. And um, this money, of course, is not for the singers. Um, this money is, is given to a chosen charity. So this is a, a really fun way of um, raising money for charity at Christmas. And uh, I understand that... Uh, the the the, uh, the British or the English government, in its wisdom, has, uh, has said that this year, despite the pandemic, 
Um, carol singing will be allowed as long as people are wearing masks when they go in the street and are socially distanced. So that's going to be a rather different kind of carol singing this year. Now, um, it also mentions um, the TV Times. Um, and that, that is a magazine that comes out every week which features all the, the week's television programs. And then it speaks about civil defense volunteers. And those were the, um, the civilians who formed like civilian, um, well, I won't say that they weren't armies, they were volunteers who did a, a lot of work during the Second World War, um, helping people um, who, who'd lost their houses in, in, in a bombing or, or whatever. And then there's also a reference to CND, uh, which is the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. And CND um, is a, a pressure group which still exists um, today. And their, their great motto was ban the bomb. Okay, ban the bomb. Um, and it, it speaks about rust. Now, I don't, I expect you're all, Maybe you know this thing, rust. Um, well, if you've got an old car and bits of it are beginning to go orange, you know what I mean? When the, car, when the metal goes orange, this is rust, okay? So, anyway, there we are. That's a little bit of glee. And grinning, press the button that started World War Three. From every corner of the earth, bombs began to fly. There were even missile jams. No traffic lights in the sky. In the times it takes to blow your nose, the people fell. The mushroom rose. House, cried the fat lady as the bingo hall moved to various parts of the town. Rush! cried the German butcher as his shop came tumbling down. Philip was in the counting house counting out his money. The Queen was in the parlour eating bread and honey when through the window flew a bomb and made them all go funny. In the in the time, what's happened to the poem? I'm sorry, sorry, we'll get there in the end. I think you're going the wrong way, Lena. I think we need to go the other way. Sorry, everybody, we'll, go, we'll, we'll, we'll get there just a minute. Yeah, that's right. After. There we are. Well, uh... <laughs> so I, I don't know. I think we'd better go back to the beginning then. Uh... Start again. Right, Icarus All Sorts by Roger McGough. A little bit of heaven fell from out of the sky one day. It landed in the ocean not so very far away. The German at the radar screen rubbed his hands with glee and grinning, pressed the button that started World War III. From every corner of the earth, bombs began to fly. There were even missile jams, no traffic lights in the sky. The time it takes to blow your nose, the people fell, the mushroom rose. House, cried the fat lady, as the bingo hall moved to various parts of the town. Raus! cried the German butcher as his shop came tumbling down. Philip was in his counting house, 
counting out his money. The queen was in the parlour, eating bread and honey. When through the window flew a bomb and made them all go funny. The time it takes to draw a breath or eat a toadstool, instant death. The rich huddled outside the doors of their fallout shelters like drunken carol singers. The poor, clutching shattered televisions and last week's edition of TV Times of the very last. Civil defence volunteers with their tin hats in one hand and their heads in the other. C&D supporters, their ban the bomb badges beginning to rust, have scrawled, I told you so, in the dust. A little bit of heaven fell from out of the sky one day, landed in Vermont, northeastern USA. The general of the radar screen should have got the sack. That wouldn't bring 3,768 people back, would it? So, oh. now we're coming back to me, I think, if we can. Thank you, Lena. Yeah, there we are. So, that's it. Um, well, I, I won't say I hope you've enjoyed it, because really, war poetry isn't something to enjoy, but... I hope that the uh, the expl explanation of the poppy was 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 interesting for those of you who didn't know it, um, and and I hope that the selection of poems um, chosen um, have given um, uh, a wide range of um, British poets, um, ranging, as I said, from from World War One up to the modern day. Um, Roger McGough is, is still alive and, and still producing poetry. I understand he unfortunately um, has had coronavirus, but I believe he, he is recovering now. So there we are. Now, I don't know if, if any of you are still, are still with us or if anybody wants to, I don't know how this works, but if anybody wants to to ask any questions or to make any comments, um, I'm sure Lena will be able to sort that out. Oh, one. No, I'm. Pardon? No one in this part. Okay. Can we can we see anyone or? Thank you. So, so what does that mean? And there was nobody listening, or there's nobody. No one, no one question. No questions. Yes. Oh, okay. Seventy-four people. Ah, oh, okay. Can can we go back to the main? Can we go back? No, only number without name. No. Can we go back to the main? Mm -hmm. Can we go back sorry. to... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, there we are. Oh, okay. Now, if nobody's got any um, comment, uh, nobody's got any questions, I don't know, maybe anybody's got any comments on any of the poems? It would be nice if somebody had something to say, but maybe you don't. <laughs> so. Okay. Well, I would just like to thank Lena for, for making this possible. Um, it's not... Doing it this way is, is, is not easy, and it's certainly not as satisfactory um, when you're the reader um, for as it, as it is, is if, you've, if you've got a live um, audience. But if there is anybody still with us um, 
who who would just like to say anything, it would be nice to hear from from somebody who is out there. Okay. Oh. We hope that uh, uh, you return to the library with a new uh, poetry poem saying. Well, if we did that, certainly I think next time we'd have something more cheerful. <laughs> we, we will do some something something more cheerful. Um, but um, yeah, well, nobody nobody out there got any comment to make. Oh yes, yeah, the English patient. That's right. Yes. Yes, yes, that would have been ceasefire, the, the, the person who was in hospital. Yes, that's right, that's very much like the English patient, that's how the English patient begins, isn't it? I think, yes, yes. Yeah. Have we finished then? Have we finished? I thought people would disappear, you know, when we had that technical hitch. But it's our first experience. Oh, it's your first experience? Yeah. Ah, okay. And congratulations, Lena. <laughs>